Here we go. Good evening, everybody. We have a very special guest, Rabbi Aftson, who has agreed. And first of all, I want to thank him for agreeing right away. Usually everybody gives me a hard time. I don't know, and I'll see, and I'll check my time. So I appreciate it. I'm going to explain why it is that we asked to have this very special guest. It's uh, very late at night there in New York, but we asked him and he agreed. Because today is the 15th day of Sivan. And the 15th day of Sivan is a special day in the lifetime and the calendar of Chabad. And as it specifically relates to the previous Rebbe, Rabbi Yisuf Yitzchak. Today, as we'll hear from the rabbi in some greater detail, but just to give you a little insight, today is the day in 1927 when the previous Rebbe was arrested. And again, remember, a prison in communist Russia was not like a nice American prison where you have a lawyer and uh, ping pong and Rebbe Shimon visits and brings you uh, potato latkes. Um, and it was through miracles upon miracles that he was in fact able to be released on a day that's celebrated as a great celebration in the world of Yud Beis Thomas. So Rabbi Aftson, first of all, thank you a thousand thank yous, really, really appreciate it. And just to give you a little background as to what uh, our Zooms are like. So when COVID began over two and a half years ago, of course, everybody was panicked about how to make Pesach and so on. So we started to do a nightly Zoom to teach people how to make their homes ready for Pesach, how to run the Seder and so on. And people kind of liked it, or at least I liked talking and they were too rude to interrupt me. So we kept it going. And we've been going now two and a half years, thank God. And on Tuesday nights, we feature special guests. And we've had an array of shluchim uh, from all over the world, from Myanmar and Taiwan and shluchim from the United States. And we've had students who go to Chabad on campus and people, community members. And it was recommended to me to reach out to you. And again, thank you for coming on and thank you for saying yes right away. Really appreciate it. Let people know Rabbi Optin is the author of numerous books, including one that he's working on now, which hopefully we'll hear about about the previous Rebbe. So Rabbi, if you would share with us about tonight, 15th of Sivan, about the previous Rebbe, about the story, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you again. We're listening. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, the previous Rebbe lived in turbulent time is not the word. He grew up in communist, in, uh, in the Zionist Russia, and he was arrested five times by the Tsar and his protégés. And then came 1917, the, the revolution, and he was arrested again in 1920, shortly after his father, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Rebbe Risha passed away. That time he was arrested for uh, just a few hours, uh, like they called it, uh, we just wanna get acquainted with you and you should get acquainted with us. But uh, in 1927 was uh, his seventh arrest. It was an arrest that uh, lasted 17 days. And this arrest, they hope will bring his untimely death. They, they planned on shooting him that night. The question is, what caused the arrest? And there's basically three factors involved in it. In Lubavitch was the headquarters of our community was our center from the second Lubavitcher Rebbe, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rebbe Shnei Zalman of Liadi, learned as a child in Lubavitch, but his center was not in Lubavitch. His center was in Liazhna and then Liadi. However, when Napoleon attacked Russia, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rebbe Shnei Zaman of Liadi, uh, sided with the Tsar, and he had to escape from Napoleon. And in Napoleon's anger, he burned down his house, everything, 
the whole city basically on his way of a defeat. So therefore, his son and successor, Reb Dovber, settled in Lubavitch. And, they, and Lubavitch was the headquarters of Reb Dovber, his son-in-law, the third Lubavitch Reb, the Tzamer Tzedek, his youngest son, the Reb Marash, his middle son, Rabbi Shalom Dave Ber, who I am here to be named after, they lived in Lubavitch. In 1914, in the middle of, in 1917, excuse me, in the middle of World War World War I, Rabbi Shalom Daivbeer left Lubavitch. Originally, it was as a temporary measure, and he settled in Rastov. And then came the communist uh, revolution, and he remained in Rastov for the next few years until his passing at the age of 59 and a half in Rastov. And he is interred in Rastov. His son remained, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak, he was his only son, only child, remained in Rastov until 1924. In 1924, he went to Moscow to discuss with communal leaders, what could be done concerning Judaism and communist Russia. And he was about to return, but his mother sent him a message, a personal messenger, that they are awaiting your return to arrest you. So he remained in Moscow, then he went to Leningrad, which was called Petersburg, and he returned six weeks later, Erev Pesach, an hour after he returned, they came to arrest him. When they came to arrest him, they asked him, why did you delay your return? And he said, well, I was told that you're not happy with what I'm doing. So I, be, so I applied for a job and I got, uh, I was appointed as a rabbi in one of the big synagogues in Leningrad. So the community over there was able to convince the police that if the rabbi leaves, they won't arrest him. And they gave him a short period of time to leave. And he left with one daughter to Leningrad. And after he found an apartment, did the whole family join him in Leningrad. So now he's in Leningrad, Petersburg, the capital of Russia, right under the nose of the KGB, et cetera, and he continued his work. Um, Purim, which was uh, the month of other, so you got uh, four months, because there was two others that year, four months before uh, now, his secretary was arrested, Yevokhan Marazov. And instead of leaving, the Rebbe made a Fabrengen in Leningrad, and he said, I am not afraid of them. And they wrote in their newspapers, MS, which they called the truth, that it's time to send the Rebbe of Lubavitch to Slovakia Islands, which is someplace in Siberia, and finished. 
So that was one, that's the general background and what led up to his final arrest. However, there's additional information which I'm working on now to clarify it. I, I'm not 100% positive, clear in every detail, but the general information is this. In Leningrad, there was the Jewish Community Council of Leningrad, which was sanctioned by the government by the communist government. So you understand that if it was sanctioned by the communist government, to a certain extent, they were in cahoots together with the government. And that's why the government kept them into business and supported them, gave them a stipend uh, to make programs hoping that they will fulfill their desires. In 1926, the head of the Leningrad Community Council came to the Rebbe and asked the Rebbe to sign on to a general meeting of all the rabbis of Russia in Leningrad. And the rabbi said that in my opinion, nothing good is going to come out about it. And I don't think so. Well, this gentleman went around Russia and he said, a white line. He said, before I came out to speak to everybody, I had a meeting with the Lubavitcher Rebbe about it, implying that the Lubavitcher Rebbe is okay with it, which is the furthest thing from the truth. And the Rebbe then came out with a letter, a proclamation against it. And they were furious on that. Now comes a second situation. There's something called in America, the JDC. I am positive some of you, or maybe all of you, have heard of the JDC, the Jewish Distribution Committee, or as some people call it, the Joint. And the JDC was involved in helping establish kibbutzim, communal farms, for Jews in Russia. And that was uh, one of the biggest social engineering projects of the beginning of the 20th century. They, they made farms for 150,000 Jews in Crimea and other places. So they were heavily involved with the Russian government. And they came to Russia to see how things are going and where exactly what. And they met with the, the Rebbe. And while the head of the JDC uh, did not like the Rebbe, and later on, fought against him tooth and nail. However, his underlings were extremely impressed by the Rebbe's work and they gave the Rebbe 
$50,000. In those days, $50,000 went long, was a very impressive amount. And the rabbi called a meeting and he shared the wealth with everybody. Now our friends in the Leningrad Community Council were full of anger. The JDC accepted the Rebbe as the leader of the Jewish community and not them. And when a person is envious, so they decided now is time we have to put a stop to this or else we are gonna be out of business. So they started pushing against the rapper. So now you have the government and the Jewish Communist Party, which we call us the Yevsexia, are against the Rebbe. And then you, you also have the Leningrad Jewish Community Council. But Russia was not ready to have this war with all the religions. And then came in the perfect trifecta, the third piece of this puzzle. Russia had an ambassador in a, one of the Baltic countries or whatever, who was shot and killed. And that Russia could not take sitting. And they decided they're going to take the heads of every Jew, every religious community, and they are going to be punished for this crime. And when the rebel was arrested late at night after he concluded Yechidis, private audiences, he was taken to a to the prison and he was told to walk down the long hallway. And if you would walk to the end of the hallway and you would go out to the courtyard, the door shut automatically behind you and there were three men with rifles that whoever walked out was shot. And that was the plan. However, Hashem in his great kindness caused the rabbi to veer off course and he went into a different hallway and he sat down and then he was able to recalibrate himself and he went into the interrogation room with the resolve that they will not intimidate me in the least. And then he was in prison for 17 days. He was allowed to leave due to pressure from President Hoover on the American side and uh, the chancellor of uh, Germany and other dignitaries. And so the death penalty was changed from death penalty to 10 years in prison, exile, three years in exile, and then after he went to exile, nine days later, he was granted his freedom. Uh, that, was, that was my fifth answer, Rabbi Epstein. Thank you.
questions or if anybody has any questions just unmute yourself we want to be respectful of the rabbi's times wow T thank you for sharing that story as i mentioned rabbi afsin is writing biography about the previous rabbi he has about all the other rabbis up until the previous rabbi so rabbi while we have people's attention maybe you can share how can they how can they get this uh your biographies is there a website how do they find them uh, the, the the stores in, the, the stores in uh, crown heights uh, sell them i try not to say which store to get it from because uh, to me they're all equal i uh, don't enjoy uh, dealing with individuals this is a picture of uh, the series it's the first book the Alter Rebbe, but uh, it's called the uh, Rabbeian Biography Series. Uh, a few years ago, my wife taught a course to the women in each of those books uh, some years ago. So they're wonderful. If anybody would like to take a moment, we want to be respectful of the rabbi's time. Unmute yourself and jump in. Otherwise, We'll say thank you. A thousand thank yous, Rabbi. We really, really appreciate your time. What a vivid story that you've told us and shared with us about how special this night is. They came in 1927. God forbid if their plan would have succeeded, that would be it. End of year. That night. No, not that would be it. That night it would have been over. Over. <laughs> gone. Finished. They understood the stature of the Friedrich Rebbe and they came to end it. And I did just to share with everybody, when I went to Russia about 12 years ago, I did actually go outside of that apartment, 22 Malachiko Street, and to think, this is it. They came that night to end Yiddishkeit. That was it. It was going to be over. And they understood what the Friedrich Rebbe meant. Uh, and at that time, you know, if you think about it, who would you bet on? This one rabbi from a town called Lubavitch or the whole Soviet empire. And here we are, less than 100 years later, and Chabad is all over the world. And the Soviet Empire has been dismissed to the trash. And let me just mention one other point before Please. anybody wants to ask. In 1930, that means two and a half years after his uh, release, the previous rabbi visited America for 10 months. Came to Chicago. Yes, he was in Chicago. He made a, a class in Chicago. Uh, he, uh, I just saw tonight that they tried to open up a yeshiva then. But he went to Philadelphia. Before, right before Chicago, he was in Philadelphia. He was in Baltimore, but he was, he was in Philadelphia. So he writes in his uh, diary that when he came to Philadelphia, the assistant to the mayor allowed him to sit on George Washington's chair in the Independence Hall. And the Friedrich Rebbe writes, the only ones that were allowed to sit on the chair was who they considered a head of state. And he was given he was given that honor as the head of the Jewish community. Tens of thousands of Jews, and it wasn't Lubavitchers. Lubavitch was a small town in Russia. Tens of thousands of Jews in every city that he came to went out to greet him by the train station. And then they gave him a wreath to put by Liberty Bell. And I never understood what's the, what's the idea of putting a wreath by the Liberty Bell. And he writes in his diary, a wreath was given to those that fought valiantly and were victorious. And normally, one was not the other. The head of the state is not the general. The general is not the head of the state. So either a person was honored with one or the other, but the previous Yerba was honored with both. Wow. 
Unbelievable. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, we're going to let the rabbi go. Spent much more than 15 minutes. We really appreciate Unless it. Unless somebody has a question. Yeah, if someone has a question, please unmute yourself and jump right. Yeah, please. I can't hear you. Yeah, a little louder, please. The books are amazing for whoever didn't read them. You should read them from the first one all the way through, and they're like clear and detailed and and very interesting and easy to read to get to know all the Rebbeim. My friends and I have read every single one. <laughs> Wonderful. Agreed. Rabbi Epstein, could you repeat the question? Yes, she's saying that she's putting in a plug for the book. She's She and her friends have read all of them. They're easy to read. They're detailed. They give you a real intimate awareness of each of the Rebbe's. And all of us strongly recommend, like I said, a few years ago, my wife taught a class on each of the books that had come out at that time, maybe the uh, through the Tzemach I don't remember. No, no, and, now through the Rebbe Shab. Yeah, Baruch Hashem, and soon to be for the Friedrich Rebbe. Okay. Give us two volumes. Two volumes. Okay. Baruch Hashem. We're looking forward to it. Anybody else got something they'd like to share or a question to ask for the rabbi? We do want to be respectful of his time, but if you jump in now, otherwise we'll say good night. Okay. So, Rabbi, I want to thank you. I want to thank you. And that's, of course, the most important thing is that we take to heart the lessons of the Friedrich Rebbe. And uh, well, the, the, the lesson. I'll just finish with one point. Please. The communist, as I mentioned, did not want to start this battle, at least most of them, the level heads of them. And they decided they're going to send a message to him. And the message was, it was sent by uh, Rabbi Pupko. Hmm. And Rabbi they, they Pupko said, in Chicago. I don't know if Chicago, but there is a Rabbi Pupko here. Okay, but it was a Rabbi Pup Pupko. Yeah. And the message was we will turn a blind eye to all of your activities. You want to have a, a male giving a bris, we'll turn a blind eye. You want to build a mikvah, we'll turn a blind eye. You want to ha have somebody to provide kosher food, we'll turn a blind eye. You want to teach in the old age home to the retired citizens, we won't do anything about it. We're asking you for one thing. Leave the children to us. Give the children to us. We'll educate them. And if somebody at the age of 18 wants to put on thrilling and wants to learn Torah, we will allow you to open up a school for him. And the rabbis replied, if there's no baby goats, there's no big billy goats. And therefore, the rabbi put everything in danger, his life included, for educating our youth. So if we are taking a lesson from tonight, it's the importance of educating the youth. And that is why the rabbi put such a tremendous emphasis, we're about to enter the summer, that every child that you know should be registered into a Jewish day camp, or overnight camp. Let the children become pride of their Jewish heritage. And with that, we should merit to greet Mashiach speaking nowadays. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Robert. This was wonderful, very, very informative. Remember, tomorrow night, everybody, we're starting a new mimer. We're going to say goodnight to the rabbi. We'll send out the recording. We'll see you tomorrow night at 9.15 for mimer. Rabbi, thank you. A thousand thank yous. Really, really appreciate it. Be, be well.